Welcome to Never Too Late for Fitness Radio, bringing baby boomers proven strategies and innovative products for getting fit, staying fit, so you can live a longer, healthier, and happier life. Here's your host, best-selling author and fitness advocate, Phil Ferris. This is Phil Ferris, and welcome to our show. Never Too Late for Fitness Radio provides answers and straight talk about fitness, nutrition, and healthy lifestyles for people over 50. Our goal is to educate and advocate health and fitness strategies that help you live a longer, healthier, and happier life. On some shows, we feature everyday people like you and me who have acted and reclaimed their health and fitness. We all love a success story, especially if the person is facing the same or similar challenges we're facing. Hearing real success stories helps inform, motivate, and inspire us to live a healthier life. On other shows, like today, uh, we focus on companies or fitness uh, experts uh, who share how they help their clients who are 50 plus achieve their health and fitness goals. Today's guest is Richard Harvey, or Rick. He has a PhD in psychology and social behavior. He was educated in California and studied as an undergraduate at the at the Berkeley and Santa Cruz campuses of the University of California, finally receiving his doctorate training at the University of California, Irvine. He is tenured in the Holistic Health Education Program at San Francisco State University. Before joining the faculty, he ran the UC Irvine Counseling Center Biofeedback and Stress Management Program, worked as a research fellow at the UC uh, Irvine Tobacco Use Research Center, uh, he also was the California Public Health Agency. Um, he has served in leadership roles at various scholarly associations, including serving as uh, past president of the Biofeedback Society of California, the Western Association of Biofeedback and Neuroscience, and the Association of Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback. He has published scholarly articles on the topics of psychophysiology, as well as psychological courage and hardiness. Thank you for being on the show today, Rick. Thank you, Phil. Well, it's great to have you. And, and you know, most people probably have heard of biofeedback, uh, but many may not understand how it works or why it's such a valuable tool for helping uh, people live a healthier life. Can you enlighten us a little bit about biofeedback? Absolutely. If you think about the distinction between statements like, I'm under stress, I don't know how much stress I'm under. Biofeedback is a tool that uses instruments to measure much more precisely types of reactions that people have to stress in their life. For example, we might be able to measure muscle tension. We might be able to measure heart rate, breathing activity. These days, even brainwave activity that used to have instruments that cost tens of thousands of dollars are now much more accessible and portable so that almost anyone can use instruments to measure their physical or biological reactions to the world. Note that I said stress reactions, and yet biofeedback is used in many ways, not only for dealing with reactions to stress, but also for improving ourselves. So for example, athletes at the Olympic Training Center use biofeedback instruments to enhance their performance. Biofeedback, simply stated, is use of instruments to give us much more precise understandings of our biological or physiological reactions, whether they be stress reactions or, in the other example, performance enhancement reactions to improve ourselves rather than just try to reduce unwanted reactions. Okay. And, and, and how does managing these physiological and, and emotional um, factors allow us to have better health and fitness? Well, that's unpacking a big question. Most of us don't need instruments to know that we're under a lot of strain in our lives. And the typical way that the medical industry, I should say pharmaceutical industry, deals with overreactions or stress reactions is to give people things like painkillers, muscle relaxants, anxiety reducing or depression reducing medications. So painkillers, muscle relaxants, antidepressants and anxiolytic medications are among the most prescribed. What that does is it treats a symptom 
but doesn't get at some of the underlying causes or problems that gave rise to those difficult or unwanted symptoms. So if we look at three categories that are typically used to address any problem that a person has, we might consider how do we become aware and train down our physiological overreactions so we can use biofeedback instruments to release or relax our muscles more rather than relying on muscle relaxant medications. We also use cognitive and behavioral psychological techniques to address the behaviors that are reactions to stress. So for example, some people may oversleep when they're under stress. Some may undersleep when they're under stress. Some may eat less and some may spend the rest of their day with their friends, Ben and Jerry, overeating <laughs> much. And the point about over or underdoing something behaviorally reflects itself in our biological reactions. So if you overeat too much, your body's going to grumble, for example, with your belly uh, being unhappy. If you, if you undersleep too much, if you're an insomniac, you're going to have some physical effect. Okay. That raises questions about using biofeedback equipment to help us sleep better, exercise better, eat better, whatever those things mean. And that's the start of a long conversation. The last is our psychological selves, our emotional life. How do we use equipment to deal with anxiety and depression and uh, anger? And so the memory mnemonic for the affective world, for the emotional world is mad, sad, glad, scared. And I'm going to add on board. And the reason I add on board is a lot of the um, world that we live in is I want something right now. I'm bored. I'm bored. I'm bored. I can't wait till, get, till I get some outcome. And that emotional status of being bored is probably emerging as a very important and interesting category to learn how to be able to sit with ourselves and be okay with a relatively slow pace of real life compared to what we believe we can achieve in our minds. Okay. And so one of the big takeaways for me is that um, if we rely on um, pharmaceuticals to uh, subdue or mask um, or deal with the symptom, we may never get to the underlying cause, which means it's going to stay there and perhaps start having complications in other areas because your body is, is not just an isolated you know, pieces of organs. They all work together. So biofeedback is a way to, to, to regain control and understanding of how to handle those kinds of issues or stress from the external world or the internal world. Is that a reasonable summary? That's a great summary, and I'll extend it in one small way with a generalization. Okay. We pay attention to shift our intention. How do we pay attention raises the question, do we need instruments such as a little device that sits on our shoulder that might vibrate and tell us that our muscles are tensing or a little wrist worn device that says our heart rate is above a certain level? How do we pay attention to things allows us then to intentionally focus on some outcome or goal that we want. So it's not only simply stress reactions, it's mostly the long duration of overreactions. That is to say, we overreact for too long a period of time and then we injure ourselves. Okay. And that's a, a simplification. Okay. Now, um, you do a lot of work in, in the area of everyday courage and hardiness. Can you explain what that is and how it impacts health and fitness, especially for the people over 50? The basic fundamental place, not only for people over 50, but for many individuals who have had some type of difficulty in their life is to be reactive. I had some type of challenging circumstance in my life, and I'm fearful that something bad is going to happen if I continue down that path. Hardiness is a concept that is beyond optimism or resiliency as an abstraction. When you have a metaphoric line and you are below the line, you're in a negative place. 
you've had some type of injury, you've had some type of negative emotional experience, there's something that's not the way you want it to be. You can be optimistic to move towards getting back to the way things were. You can be resilient when you bounce back to base. However, that's just going back to the way things were. Courage and psychological hardiness is about pushing yourself towards a greater goal, going above your line in a calculated, deliberate, consistent way in service to bettering yourself. So distinguishing from optimism and resiliency, which are very important concepts, we want to also learn to influence the outcomes. The hardiness literature talks about three attitudes or beliefs that a person can have. Attitude one includes learning and growing from our experiences. And that's summarized by the concept of challenge. The second is the concept of control, that it's possible to influence your world. The third is the concept of commitment, not only that you can learn and grow from challenging circumstances, not only that you can influence your world and control the outcomes, but also that it is meaningful and worthwhile to commit to the better goals that you aspire to. Challenge, control, and commitment, commitment, control, and challenge, regardless of the order, interact with all of the mm, hardiness reflection because the reflection of this attitude of hardiness is built on you learn and grow, you can influence the outcomes, and you can commit to the greater goal that you have despite the difficulties. I'm going to okay. stop there because that's kind of abstract. Okay. Can you give me a specific example of someone, uh, uh, perhaps a, uh, someone you've worked with or aware of, that would, that would embody that concept of, of uh, hardiness and, and uh, everyday courage? The kind of athletes that I've worked with include folks that get disheartened when they know that there's an injury in their lives, for example, and they may never get back to the way things were. So I was working with a runner who had injured their leg and they, through despite their strong um, desire, their high commitment level was unable to control the severity of their injury. That is to say, you know what, they might not ever run again, or if they would, they might not ever compete at the high level that they were able to in the past. So one of their reactions was, I'm doomed, I'm never going to be an athlete anymore, I'm not going to be able to compete very well. And they started distracting themselves, they started metaphorically drowning their sorrows, they, they looked at alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs before they started realizing this isn't a good path for me. I don't want to wallow in my sorrows. They were able from the learning and growth that came from the challenge of their circumstances to say, you know what? I cannot control my injury. However, I can influence my involvement in athletics and sports. So they started helping out the coach. They started improving the techniques that athletes have for avoiding injury and they contributed positively to the team. They were able to become an assistant coach. They were able to be on at all the meets in the same way with a great deal of respect, not only from the coach, but eventually uh, as an assistant coach, they had a status within the team. And so they transformed their difficult circumstances rather than avoiding and running away into alcohol, tobacco, or other drugs, they were able to learn and grow from that circumstance, influence their world, and commit to the new way of involving them themselves in the sport. Okay. That's, that's, a, that's a great example. Um, I, I can think back to a situation that I was in a, a, year, a number of years back. I fell off a ladder and broke both wrists. And so I, I could. So I was in a cast for like uh, six months, and I couldn't drive. For the first couple of months, I couldn't even use a phone or write. Um, and I was a consultant, which required me calling people and seeing people. And when I finally got to the position where I could 
uh, make calls and, and send emails and, and letters to people, uh, I saw the problem that I had to get face to face with them. And the issue I had was I was always the person in charge. I could always take care of myself and I couldn't do it. And so I had a neighbor that came and she said, you know what? Um, I'll drive you to your appointments. So I would make appointments on the phone and then she would pick me up. She would take me sometimes an hour away, drop me off. I'd make my sales call with two casts on my hands. Um, and then I would make my sales call. Then I come back and she'd take me back home. And what I learned from that was I don't have to be independent. I don't have to be the guy that does it. And it was very hard, but and very humbling, but it was also very liberating if I say, I need help. And I never would have done that or learned that had I not broken both wrists. And I, my business got better and made sales. And it was because of the help of other people that I was able to do that. So that I think that's a personal issue for me that I can say, well, yeah, that's where I probably, I, it would put them very easy just to sit there and, you know, uh, be wallow in my sorrows and, and, and not do anything. And so I, I again, I, I appreciate the fact that other people did step up for me. Um, you, you also remind me of a distinction between masculine and feminine approaches to dealing with difficult life circumstances. And a more masculine approach tends to be, I would say, um, to tough it out, to be a a lone wolf to be a person that says, oh, I, I don't want to be reliant on anybody else. A more feminine approach tends to be more, um, as opposed to individualistic, tends to be more um, communal, more get the assistance from others while we um, move through our challenging circumstances. And in both cases, humans have masculine and feminine tendencies at times. The hardiness concept is independent of masculine and feminine tendencies. It says regardless of who you are, you will be able to express the learning from experiences, influencing the outcomes, and committing towards the, the difficult circumstance. As tough as it is, it's worth your while rather than running away. Okay. And that is a more... Um, ordinary sense of the word courage compared to the often used idea of, for example, firefighters saving people from a burning building or soldiers in a war zone saving uh, fellow uh, uh, fighters um, and getting them out of harm's way. And the threat under fire, both literal fire and uh, gunfire, is how we often think of the extreme circumstances of courage. What I like about the hardiness concept is that it's more the everyday, ordinary sense of courage. Okay. Now, just so if, if um, to, to, to drill down on that just a little bit, what would be some um, triggers or symptoms or feelings that people may have that might let them know that? You could use, you know, you're, you're being challenged by your everyday uh, courage, and maybe you need some additional training or help in this area. So, how would someone know that that would be something they needed to work on? There's two or three um, parts to your question. The first one is how do we know from inside ourselves versus how do we know when other people tell us things? For okay. example, um, how do you know when other people tell you, hey, this isn't working out, is usually by somebody either overtly saying, you know, that's a wrong path or that's not going to work for you. Well, what they're saying is that didn't work for me and you might want to gain from my experiences as well. If you're an athlete, somebody will usually say, a coach, um, tr move in this way, try that activity. And let's see what happens because then we can chart or track progress or regress based on the path you've chosen. That's distinct from, I know inside that this doesn't feel right or this feels great. It raises the question of possible versus preferable. If you're an athlete and the coach says, try these things, try these physical activities or this rehab or some other type of way to overcome an injury, or try this new way to improve your uh, reaction time at the starting line. Those are possibilities. However, they might not be preferences for the athlete. They might not be things that they like to do, even if it's possible to do. 
I'll give you a, a, a different or concrete example. If somebody said, you know what, I'm not an athlete. I'm just getting into increasing my physical activity throughout the day. And somebody says, let's start with a walk around the block. Well, walk around the block is possible. However, some people don't like the walk around the block in their neighborhood. It might be too cold outside. So that's an external circumstance that's beyond their control. Or it might be an unsafe neighborhood, whatever unsafe means. So it's possible to go walking, but it's not preferable for them. What hardiness does is it allows a person to identify those circumstances that they are able to control so that they can find that win-win direction to head towards, that they can find the ability to say, you know what, whereas you suggested walking and that's great for you, that particular walk is not great for me for these reasons. However, what would be a better circumstance is the following. Let's go to a different neighborhood. Or let me help me buy better clothing so that I don't freeze or I don't get rained on or you know, I get better sneakers. Whatever it is, that you need in order to accomplish your goal because you're committed to it is what the hardiness attitudes allow. Okay. And they help you systematically identify what the barriers are and those things that are going to help you facilitate getting to your goals. Okay. And, and for our people over 50, um, they're, they're entering into areas of their lives where um, a lot of things may seem out of control, out of their control. Um, and that, you know, things like uh, they're more apt to lose a spouse after 50. Having chronic pain uh, makes it difficult to exercise. Uh, getting chronic diseases uh, can be, oh, poor me. Um, you know, changes in, um, you know, your, your lifestyle in terms of empty nesters, so that, that change in role. So all these things are very real things that happen to people over 50 that can put you in a position of feeling kind of isolated or, or uh, powerless. Uh, and so the everyday courage is to say, there are possibilities here. There's things to learn and, and optimize. And, and if they understand that, you know, if they can get through it and not just get, like you said, back to base one, they can get to a higher goal, to a, to a better place. And so that's really important for people to understand that when you go through these periods where you do feel helpless or uh, out of sorts, um, there are options. Does that make sense? It does, and more importantly, the first step in understanding any hardiness attitude or belief is commonplace in almost every psychological as well as mind-body psychophysiological analysis. And if you go to a counselor of any kind, especially ones that employ biofeedback equipment, the first step that they're going to do is build perspective in the following ways. For example... What's the best case and worst case scenario that you might imagine? What's the worst case you're going to have pain and you know, discomfort for the rest of your life, or you're going to never recover from your injury or something along those lines. And by building perspective, you ask more concrete questions. As bad as that is, how likely is that outcome to be in your life as you, as you state, oh yeah, it's possible, but it's, it's less than 50, 50. It's probably less than 10%. It might even be less than 5%. Now all of a sudden you've built perspective about how much you fear is based on an unlikely outcome. Okay. And you flip it around and say, how likely is it that your best case scenario is going to come about? Oh, I'm going to have a perfect body and perfect world and perfect life and no pain. And you know, not lonely and anything else. And how likely is that idealistic view to come about? Well, that's not very likely, but it's more likely that if I do the following things, that my better scenario is going to come about. And what do you have to do in concrete, realistic terms? What materials do you need? Do you need better clothes? Do you need to, to more money? Do you need to talk with somebody? Do you need, what is it that you need allows you to then proceed with that control attitude of what can you influence versus what's out of your control. You can't control the economy. You can't control your parents. You can't control the weather. However, you are able to influence in the following ways. When you influence something, you build that control attitude. You learn from your experiences. Then you can recommit. And those three belief systems, commitment, control, and challenge, abstractly, 
interact in order to build your courage to say, you know, it's difficult, but I can manage compared to I'm going to be overwhelmed and undermined. Okay. Now, how does biofeedback help or help implement that process? It gives you concrete, measurable outcomes based on physiological and biological indicators. And whatever those indicators are that are good for you to measure, biofeedback can assist. For example, if you know that, for example, you have sore neck and shoulders at the end of the day, and a lot of people get sore neck and shoulders, you can wear a portable muscle monitor that can let you know when and the degree to which your muscles are tightening. The same thing is true with our heart rate. If our heart rate goes above a certain level, if we're an athlete, we want to understand our maximum heart rate capacity. However, if you're a sedentary individual and your heart rate goes up to a high level, one that we would expect when you're physically active and yet you're sitting down, that suggests a more fear type of reaction. A lot of times we know that we're reacting. We don't know how much we're reacting. And Biofeedback allows a person to do two things. First, monitor physiological and biological reactions that are associated with our ideas and our thoughts. And second, learn and grow, train ourselves to influence, to regulate those reactions. Okay, so let me, if I can, um, so let's say I know that um, I'm very uncertain about um, going on a job interview after 50. And so how might you help me deal with the anxiety of going out on the job market after 50 using biofeedback? What would be some things that you would perhaps key in on uh, that would help me manage my situation as I go forward and do the interview? The first part is the link between the reactions that your body has compared to the overreactions that your body has. It's normal. It's expected. We all get nervous going on a job interview, even if you are very well qualified and there's a very high likelihood that you're going to succeed. In fact, if you didn't get worried, I would say that that candidate did not care about the possibilities of that job. So if I don't find a reactive individual when they go on a job interview, for example, I would be concerned that they're not invested in, in the job. On the other hand, what I don't want is a person who's freaking out and panicking, who's overreacting to the difficulties of a job interview. So what biofeedback does is it allows us in two ways. First, monitor your reactions. Are they within a, an appropriate realm? for that difficult circumstance versus train ourselves to turn the dial down to metaphorically mm, uh, calm the system or regulate our reactions so that we're not overreacting, but rather we're appropriately reacting for whatever challenges are in front of us. Could you give me more control over our reactions? So if I'm getting ready for an interview and I say, okay, my heart rate's a little raised, but not too high. Yeah, I got a little tension in my shoulders, but you know, I, I'm not like cement. Um, yeah. My hands feel a little clammy, but th- th- I'm not pouring sweat. So therefore, yeah. I'm probably in a good, so I'm, I'm looking for specific cues that I can become aware of that say, hey, you're in the right place, as opposed to, man, you're in trouble. You got to, you got to dial it back some. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to be a little bit um, technical with jargon for a minute. Okay. The, the human research, the human body has two major systems. One of them is a sympathetic nervous system, which is more the speeding things up and making things go faster nervous system. And then there's going from I'm interested, I'm engaged, I'm focused, and my heart is active, but not overly reactive where I'm interpreting the circumstances beyond my capacity to deal with it. When we have that beyond the capacity to deal with it interpretation or appraisal, then a different system kicks in and they sometimes call it the the fight or flight system. And the appropriate raising of our heart rate versus the mm, overreaction 
increases in our body responses have particular names. So one is the sympathoadrenal medullary activation system, and one is the um, uh, um, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal cortex. And that HPA, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal cortex, or PAC, it's a, um, a pituitary adrenal cortical activation system, is associated with a threat response where we're interpreting what's going on as this is too much, it's overwhelming, it's beyond my ability to respond, I'm going to tighten up my blood vessels, I'm going to get ready to fight and flee. Compared to a, a, a different system, which is I'm going to be attentive, I'm going to be vigilant, I'm going to I'm going to focus on my task at hand, but know that it's not yet to the point that I'm overwhelmed. It's not yet to the point that it's undermining my ability to respond. And those are the subtle distinctions between, mm, I'm going to use two other words. One is called use stress versus distress. As opposed to just stress, it's kind of like the good stress and the bad stress. Use stress is the is the tolerable kinds of stress, whereas distress is the overwhelming kinds of stress. Okay. And one of the tolerable kinds of stress can raise our heart rate, but our blood vessels can still continue to stay open and let the blood flow. Whereas the overwhelming kind of stress, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal fight or flight kinds of stress leads not only to increases in heart rate, but also constriction in our blood vessels or vasoconstriction. And that distinction between increased heart rate, however, vasodilation or not constriction on the one hand versus constriction on the other is one way to distinguish between overwhelming or toxic forms of stress reactions versus tolerable or manageable forms of stress reactions. Now, I just used a bunch of jargon, but... So I think that, that that's important that people understand that there is there are differences and a lot of them are within our you know internally based on how we perceive what's going on and then we have a physiological reaction and biofeedback is a is a way to start looking intangible information because the feedback gives you uh, hey your heart rate's going up or uh, your muscles are tense and so all of a sudden they start seeing you start seeing in real time information to let you know this is getting to that distress level. And I, I start to recognize what that feels like, what, I, what it looks like. And then I start looking at ways to bring that back down. So I become in control of the panel, the, the, the instrument panel that I, that's my body, yes. as opposed to, you know, who's, who's turning all the knobs. And, yeah. and so it's really getting that specific for people so that they can be in control. It's, oh, I, I recognize that cue now. I can do this if I relax my shoulders, if I take a deep breath, if I do these things. I'm back into control and I'm in the place where I want to be as opposed to, gee, how do I get out of here? And by the way, you don't necessarily need instruments all the time. You don't need a continuous monitoring and feedback and training of all of your body responses. That could get annoying. <laughs> Walk uh, around I, with I, a, I got to see if I'm upset. Let me check my instruments. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you should be able to tell inside you are your own instrument. Basically speaking, I'll give you a, a, a different concrete example. And, and Around uh, the World War II era, there were researchers, uh, Schultz and Luthi, who studied a, a practice called autogenic training. Autogenics is self-generated um, uh, understanding of your biological reactions. And earlier, I used the words vasodilation and vasoconstriction. Vaso meaning the vascular, the blood vessel systems, and that reactivity of your blood vessels determines how much blood is going to be in the tissues. How many of us have ever had cold hands and feet? Well, if your hands are cold, that means there's less warm blood in, in your hands. Now imagine, if you would, a metaphor of a sponge. If you have a sponge that's filled with warm water, it feels heavier. And if you squeeze the sponge and all that warm liquid goes out, then the sponge becomes lighter. Well, it turns out that if you can help a person become aware of feelings of heaviness or warmth in their hands or their arms, for example, that suggests that the, those tissues, those sponge-like tissues in our arms and our hands, for example, are now filled with more warm liquid, call it blood. 
that warm blood in your hands that can be felt in, inside suggests that you have an opening of your blood vessels, even if your heart rate is increased. Autogenic training, for example, is a different type of biofeedback without instruments, training people to become aware of the ability to control their heart and their blood as it circulates through the body. So even if you are injured and you have less blood providing nutrients and oxygen to those injured tissues, you can with biofeedback instruments or without instruments with something like autogenic training, guide, control, influence, or otherwise increase the likelihood that you'll be able to direct more life-giving warm blood and oxygen-filled blood to those tissues, which is usually healing and restorative. Okay. That's, that's, that's helpful because, you know, a lot of times we think of, uh, you know, biofeedback is you have to have the instruments initially, but you're saying there are plenty of other ways to get biofeedback, which is just, you know, getting in touch with what's going on in your body and then taking control of it. Imagery, visualization, yoga, prayer, uh, tai chi, qigong, Tai Chi, Qigong, and yoga tend to be active forms of moving the blood around, becoming aware of your muscles, becoming aware of your circulation, as well as your breathing, which I haven't talked about, but I will in, a, in, a, in just a little bit. And then the se second piece is the non-movement-oriented techniques like imagery and visualization and hypnosis and prayer and autogenic training. Okay. And I mentioned prayer not to put a big capital P, got to go to a church temple or mosque to pray, but rather sort of the internal getting in touch with the larger, larger, greater um, uh, connections in the world. And all of the techniques abstractly as categories, imagery, visualization, prayer, autogenics, hypnosis, are cognitive techniques. The physical techniques like yoga, tai chi, and qigong are more moving your body techniques. Link with uh, not only the blood vessels and the circulation system and the heart system, but also the, the breathing system. Because it's the synchronization of our heart and our lungs that allows that oxygenation and that nutrient-filled blood to get to the tissues, allowing our muscles to not only circulate, but also relax, circulate blood and relax the skeletal muscles so that we can become more active and more highly performing as an athlete. But without the link of our breathing and biofeedback by and large has two major techniques that are very popular right now. One of them is called heart rate variability training. And another one would be neurofeedback or brainwave training. When we use heart rate variability training, we are training the individual to synchronize the relationship between their heart and their lungs. I'll give you a simple example. Okay. Uh, suppose that our heart beats about once a second, so 60 times in a minute. And that's pretty typical as a resting heart rate for a lot of well-toned individuals, their heart would beat about once a second and average or median breathing rate for a seated individual, just resting individual, is about 15 breaths in a minute. 15 breaths in a minute goes into 60 beats of the heart in a minute, about a four to one ratio. That is to say, if we breathe in and out 15 times in a minute and our heart is beating once a second or 60 times in a minute, 15 breaths goes into one minute's time four times. So we have a relationship of a four to one uh, heartbeats to breath uh, ratio. If you breathe faster and you're seated, you might be breathing about every other second. So 30 times in a minute. Uh, <laughs> and that's over breathing or hyperventilation. That's more of a panic breathing situation. Right. So that's a um, two to one relationship. That is to say, breathing in and out every other second, 30 times in a minute compared to heart beating 60 times. And if we go to a very, very slow breathing pace, for example, if we breathe in and out over a 10 second period, for example, breathing in and out for four, in for four or five seconds and out for 
five or six seconds. That 10 second period in and out over 10 seconds goes into a minute, goes into 60 seconds, six times. We know that calm, slow, meditative breathing is at about a six breath a minute pace compared to ordinary folks at about 15 breaths a minute, you know, somewhere between 10 and 18 breaths a minute, but call it 15. And then over breathing, panic breathing is about uh, 30 breaths in a minute. So heart rate variability training tries to synchronize a resting heart rate at around 60 beats a minute and a resting breathing rate at about six breaths a minute, which is breathing in and out over a 10 second period. And that six breath per minute breathing rate helps coordinate and synchronize many of the human body functions that allows the blood to circulate very efficiently, that allows that blood to get the oxygen that it needs to perfuse through all the organs, not only the heart and the lungs, but the liver and the kidneys and other uh, pancreas, other vascular systems, as well as all of your musculoskeletal systems. So, okay, so that's, a, that's a good technique. Is that something, does that mean that I have to be doing the uh, six breaths a minute all the time in no. order to get the benefits? No. Call it five minutes a couple times a day. My colleagues say 15 minutes a couple times a day, so 30 minutes a day. But uh, as little as five minutes, relatively speaking, increasing the synchronization between your heart and your lungs greatly, dramatically improves the capacity of your muscle memory and your organ memory, that is to say how your organs realize or recognize that they're in a good place is when everything is in, they call it a resonant frequency. The, 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 the native frequency of your heart and your lungs is optimized at around that six breath per minute rate. And that'll help coordinate many other functions in your, in your brain and your body. Okay, so that's heart rate variability. Uh, you mentioned rate, uh, I, I'm going to call it heart rate variability training or HRV training is the category of biofeedback or physiological feedback training that is very commonly in the more recent Olympic athlete training centers and folks that work with anxiety and depression and post traumatic s- strain uh, spectrum. There are many, many categories that it's very, very beneficial for attentional deficits, um, as well as ordinary, just getting together and getting up in the morning and having a good life. Okay. That, that sounds like a, that's a real keeper that anybody can do. And getting your body in sync is probably a, a good thing to do at least a couple times a day. Right. And again, that's seated and resting compared to when you're on the athletic field or at the gym or working out, for example, the ratio is going to shift, obviously, because your muscles are active and your heart and your lungs are at a faster pace. That said, getting the body used to what it feels like inside to have a healthy synchronization between your heart and your lungs, which then also sends a signal to the brain that says, oh, my muscles don't need to be tight. They can be loose and letting that blood flow in a healthy way. Okay. And, and you made a point that this is something you should do regularly. And if you do it regularly, you'll become more aware of when you are or not in that right place. So you can adjust it. Um, it's not like I got to eat healthy. So I'm going to have a piece of broccoli and therefore I'm better. No, no, I mean, no, no, no. It's not a, it's not, it's by the way, I don't think anybody would think that life is as simple as eating broccoli or taking a pill and call me in the morning and every, all I need to do is colon fill in the blank. All I need to do is eat broccoli. All I need to do is take a pill. My world is always all of the above. It's how we eat. It's how we exercise. It's how we sleep. It's how we relax or restore ourselves. And each of those are categories that are specific to the context of the individual within their life. I can say, however, that when I was suggesting this heart rate variability biofeedback training is useful for most folks, I wanted to add on that there are a couple of additional elements to remember. For example, it's the way that humans and that people learn to try new things that matters a lot. So if I'm giving an instruction to 
to a new person, a new trainee about how to do this heart rate variability biofeedback, even without instruments, I would say the following things. I would look at their physical posture. Are they slumped over as their head down as if they're looking at a smartphone, which raises sore neck and shoulder and eye strain issues? No, I would say sit in a, in a posture in the chair, legs uncrossed, feet flat on the ground in a way that the chair supports you uh, uh, healthfully, begin in a posture that makes sense. I would also have them close their eyes to tune out visual distractions. I would have them begin listening to the sounds around them. Listen to the sound of my voice. Listen to any fan noise on your computer, a high-pitched electrical hum from the Wi-Fi signals, sounds that are outside the window or outside in a hallway, sounds that are coming from your own body that include a sneeze, a cough, even the breath sounds you can listen to, any sounds at all, before I would ask them to shift awareness into their breathing so that they breathe over a 10-second in and out, for example, Please now breathe in over a count of about four or five seconds. And exhale for five or six seconds. So I have them quiet their visual stimuli with their eyes closed, listen to the sounds outside of their body, and then I would ask them to start feeling things in their muscle system for example, imagine as they continue to breathe in and out over 10 seconds that the air is coming in in three dimensions around them as they expand their rib cage and their lungs, that the air is coming in also through the back, even through the bottom of their chair, even through the bottom of their feet. Imagine that the air is coming in so that they can begin to literally feel the lower lobes of the lungs expanding not just the upper region in their chest, but the lower belly region, for example. They can feel the, even the pelvic floor muscles relax as they breathe in fully and deeply. Then bring their attention to their jaw. Let the tip of their tongue float down to the base of the mouth, relaxing the tongue muscles. What that does is it releases the jaw and the tongue muscles that are used for talking. The internal dialogue that people experience that internal chatterbox is relaxed or released or quieted as we literally pay attention to releasing and relaxing our jaw and our tongue muscles. Then I begin to ask them to think of someone who is nice or kind in their life, who makes them feel safe or reassured, knowing that they can always have a settled, safe place to retreat to, knowing that they're in a safe experience is central to beginning the biofeedback training. Because when a person feels safe, they can feel the heaviness and the warmth go through their muscle system. It can trigger the part of the brain that allows them to regenerate the parasympathetic nervous system. And then they can begin training, know that they can influence their circumstances. They can learn and grow from the activity. And then they can commit to whatever it takes however many training sessions are necessary for them in their lives, knowing that it's not an instantaneous, just eat a piece of broccoli or take a pill, but rather an opportunity to gradually, progressively move towards some better space or place. And that it will take courage because there will be some obstacles or barriers, but knowing that it's difficult but manageable is the place that we want to be. And that's, again, the hardiness approach to biofeedback and self-regulation training. And I'm going to ask them to wiggle their fingers with the toes and come back and yawn and stretch and, and pay attention to whatever they need to do. That was a very excellent, not only explanation, but example of um, the process that perhaps you're advocating. Um, and I want to thank you for that. That was, that was well done. Um, and because, you know, people do think of you know, different strategies as being very difficult and uh, you know, way out there, and you just in a very simple couple minutes demonstrated that it's a very easy process, a very comforting process that can put us back into a position of health and, and alignment. So, 
that was great. Um, I, I, want, I want to finish up our time today here with a, the last question is, um, with your experience with biofeedback, um, what's the biggest lesson you've learned that you could share with people over 50 that would allow them to uh, utilize it as a, as a, as a uh, approach to helping them have a healthier, happier life? That's a great question. And the answer is the art is the practice. That is to say, whatever the techniques, plural, may be, whether it be a biofeedback approach with instruments or non-instrumented biofeedback, paying attention to our physical body, as well as the links between how we think about things, is a, non, is a simple but difficult task. For some people, touching their toes with their fingers is a simple instruction. Please touch your toes with your fingers. However, it's simple but difficult for some people. Biofeedback is also simple. However, practice makes it less difficult. A hardiness attitude shift says it's difficult but manageable. I can influence my world. One of my colleagues in the Chicago area, Dr. Serena Wadwa, is a professor at Governor State University, trains and teaches folks in a similar way who have the courage to face very, very difficult life circumstances and still persist towards their goals because they can learn how to use instruments or non-instrumented biofeedback in order to learn and grow to control their circumstances and to commit to a better outcome. Again, abstract, but still useful. I, I think the big takeaway for me, which is kind of common, it's really the habits that you develop that will allow you to be healthy. And, you know, you talk about the practice, practices to have something that you do routinely to better your circumstances, your health, that, you know, working out one day isn't going to get you healthy. Eating one piece of broccoli isn't going to, it's the ongoing incorporation of habits that give you the control of your, of your body, of your emotions and your life. So uh, you've given some great examples. Um, Rick, if people want to learn more about Everyday Courage and biofeedback or to contact you, where would you have them go? There are three ways. Of course, as a professor at a university, I have a public uh, website at San Francisco State University through the Holistic Health Education Program. And they can always email me, letter R, Harvey, H-A-R-V-E-Y, at S-F-S-U dot E-D-U, that's San Francisco State University. And the separate piece is many opportunities are available through the Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback, the AAPB dot uh, org is um, one of the places to start. There's a Western Association of Biofeedback and Neuroscience, W-A-B-N. That's one of the uh, affiliates. And there are many, many other associations to investigate. And I'm glad to share with anybody uh, that's interested any of the biofeedback resources. There are many, many wonderful equipment manufacturers for people to explore as well. And if you just type into Google something like biofeedback equipment, you'll get many, many wonderful resources and names. Well, thank you. Again, Rick, what I really appreciate is not only explanation, but the concrete examples of, of making sure that people understand that biofeedback is, is, a, is a multifaceted process that they can embrace and help them in a lot of different ways, especially for the people over 50 who are going through some challenges that may make them feel like they've lost control and this is a way of getting that control back so they can live a healthier, happier, uh, long, longer life. So thank you so much for sharing your time and your information. My pleasure indeed. Happy holidays coming up. All right, you too. Take care. Bye-bye, Phil. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Never Too Late for Fitness Radio, hosted by Phil Ferris. To learn more about the guests or resources on our show today, or to listen to past episodes, go to nevertoolateforfitness.com.